in the same area in London, Texas, in the same layer, or similar, a similar layer, a Cretaceous layer, they also found a metal hammer. They call it the London Artifact, named after London, Texas. And I've got a replica of that as well. This is a, a hammer. Part of the handle had turned into coal, so it was very, very old. Very old. And here's that very hammer. The part you think is turned into coal, Brock, is a bit of tiny carbonization near the tip. For all we know, it could be a burn mark. Other than that, this hammer is very unfossilized. So what are your thoughts? Hypotheses 1, the creation 1, maybe dinosaurs and man lived together and these are just artifacts from before the flood. Okay, what's the scientist's view? Possibility 2, maybe aliens came here, dropped off these hammers. Hang on, what? Maybe aliens came here dropped off these hammers, and then a Tyrannosaurus rex had to evolve human-like fingers to pick up all of these artifacts being left by the aliens. You mean you think the explanation you want your audience to swallow, that this hammer was put there by people who drowned in a global flood caused by an invisible being, you think that explanation is so ridiculous that the only way you can sell it is by putting it up against a story that's even more absurd? How many ideas did you discard before you hit on the one that had T-Rex evolving human-like fingers and cleaning up hammers dropped by aliens? Now what, Brock? Are you going to see if people will vote that the global flood idea is marginally more credible than the T-Rex with human fingers tidying up alien hammers? Now, I just want to take a quick survey. How many of you think the creation, the biblical view of humans and dinosaurs living together is more likely? Okay. Okay. And how many think the alien hypothesis is more likely? Anyone? Yeah, no one. Okay. Hey, I voted for the alien. Or try the option favored by people who study rocks professionally. It was exposed to water and minerals were precipitated out, collecting on the surface. It's a very common process known as concretion. So the first thing to check is whether the artifact was found in or near water. Yes, says Carl Bau, who owns the artifact and keeps it at his Creation Evidence Museum. Concretion works like this. As water travels over or through rock, it dissolves minerals. If it's travelling through sandstone, it'll pick up a lot of silicates. If it's travelling through limestone, it'll pick up a lot of calcium carbonate. When it slows or stands still on a surface, these minerals are precipitated out, and over time they build up a concretion. Most concretions are made of carbonates, sulfates and chlorides because they dissolve and precipitate much more readily than silicates. Concretion isn't the exception, it's more the rule for objects found underwater. Brock Lee seems to think it takes thousands of years for this to happen and therefore the hammer must be thousands of years old. So if we put an object under a waterfall, just like the hammer, we wouldn't see a concretion form, right? Well, <laughs> wrong! Here's that very thing happening before our eyes at the Petrifying Well at Knaresborough in Yorkshire. They call it the Petrifying Well because petrifying means turning into stone. Of course, now we know that it's just concretion. No one these days believes the medieval superstition that these artefacts are being petrified. OK, almost no one. So if I can put a teddy bear on a waterfall ledge and it gets encased in a mineral concretion, it doesn't mean that the bear is as old as the rock it sits on, or that the rock is as young as the bear. But what about this mysterious object from the deep, dark past, which was found in a desert? To Carl Bau, this is yet another piece of evidence of a mysterious civilization that was wiped out by the biblical flood. Cue spooky music. February 13th, 1961, in the Coso Mountains, six miles northeast of Valancia, California, three rock hunters found a stone located near the top of a peak, approximately 4,300 feet above sea level. The following day, the rock was cut open with a diamond blade saw. Inside were the remains of some form of mechanical device. The device consisted of a three-quarter inch wide cylinder made of solid porcelain or ceramic. And in the center of the cylinder was discovered a two millimeter thick shaft of bright metal. This shaft was magnetic and showed no signs of oxidation. Circling the ceramic cylinder were rings of copper. X-rays taken by the Child Ford Society indicated that to one end of the metallic shaft was affixed a spring or helix of metal. Indications are that it is some form of electrical instrument, otherwise known as a spark plug. The artifact itself has been lost, but when Pierre Stromberg of Pacific Northwest Skeptics sent X-ray photos of it to the president of the Spark Plug Collectors of America, he wrote back, 
I knew what it was the moment I saw the X-rays, a 1920s-era champion spark plug. Bill Bond, curator of a private museum of spark plugs, also had no doubt about what it was, a 1920s champion spark plug. But spark plug collector Mike Healy identified it as something else. No, just kidding. He concluded it was a 1920s champion spark plug. And Jeff Barteld, vice president of the spark plug collectors, confirmed in writing that it was a 1920s champion spark plug. The material it was wrapped in was probably a lump of clay, which might have collected around the spark plug and then rolled around in running water during a flash flood. When the flood was over, the desert sun baked it hard. No one can say that's what happened without a physical examination, but it's a more plausible explanation than ancient people having some advanced desert civilization that was wiped out by a global flood and left no trace except a 1920s champion spark plug. Since Pacific Northwest skeptics successfully debunked this ancient proof of a biblical flood, you would have thought that would be the end of it. But no, another bunch of believers has also laid claim to the artifact and are quite happy to accept that it's a spark plug. Cue spooky music. No one today can explain its existence. Yes, they can. It was a type of spark plug used in a Ford Model T or a Model A engine. According to Stromberg's research, there were mining operations in that area in the 1920s, which would easily explain the presence of a spark plug. There have been many theories which say that life has been deliberately sent to Earth from another planet. Some experts ridicule these ideas. No, you don't have to be an expert to ridicule the idea that a civilization from another planet had a technology advanced enough to make its way across hundreds of light years of space in a spacecraft powered by champion bloody spark plugs. Compared to that, the creationists are a breath of fresh air. Here's another artifact, a crappy old hat. It might have some value as a hat if someone hadn't left it at the bottom of a flooded mine shaft in Tasmania, but after a century under water, calcium carbonate has been precipitated into the pores and turned the hat rigid. Answers in Genesis isn't stupid enough to think this proves that biblical people travelled to Australia and wore 19th century style felt hats. It uses the hat as proof that fossilization can occur very rapidly. OK, in that case, along with this fossil teddy bear, here's a fossilised bath, a fossilised sink, a fossilised faucet, and a fossilised pipe. Look, if you want to show that fossilization can occur relatively rapidly, just open a geology textbook. This has been known for years. But that doesn't mean all fossilization is rapid. It depends on the type of organic material and the type of mineral that's replacing it, along with a long list of other factors. Calcium carbonate can do the job relatively quickly, silica does it much more slowly. But none of the artefacts being shown here has been fossilized or petrified. These are just concretions. The zeal of some creationists in trying to prove rapid fossilization even impairs their ability to read. At least that's what I hope is turning Nephilim free blind. Two new fossils were found in a pit in what was once a cave, their bones preserved by hardened sediment that buried them in a flood shortly after they died researchers said. Now consider, they just stated, hardened shortly after they died. Are we reading the same text, Sporty? Read that again. Hardened shortly after they died. No, it doesn't say hardened shortly after they died. Come on now, what does it really say? They buried them in a flood shortly after they died. That's right. The fossil was buried shortly after it died. It would take the sediment much longer to harden. But you must have some motive for such a brazen misreading of a quote we can all plainly see. They stated something correct here. It does not take thousands of years for things to fossilize. Again, you must not be reading the same quote we are. Nowhere in this quote does it say anything about how long the skeleton took to fossilize. All it says is that burial was rapid. That doesn't mean the hardening of the sediment was rapid. And it certainly doesn't mean fossilization was rapid. What makes me laugh is that archaeologists spend a lot of their time trying to get this crap off the artefacts they find, but creationist museums are spending thousands of dollars buying up old tools and bits of clothing because they've got this crap on them. The moral is that if you want to make some money, put a discarded shoe under a hard water waterfall, come back in ten years and sell it to your local creationist museum. Oh, and don't forget to tell them that you found it in a strata of rock that's supposed to be millions of years old. I know what you're thinking. Surely creationists now understand concretions. Surely none of them would be stupid enough to want a bit of old junk that can so easily be covered in crap. 
Hmm. I wonder if some of them still might. Mummified dog stuck in a tree. Here's a petrified hat. Petrified pickle. Here's petrified sacks of flour. Here's petrified toadstool. Here's petrified acorns. This kid sent them to me. He said, Brother Hovind, I was, I was seven years old at the time. He said, I stuck these acorns in a bucket of water, and I thought they might, you know, sprout and make some trees, and I forgot about them. Next spring, my mama found the bucket on the back porch, and the acorns had turned to stone. He said, would you like them for your museum?